Hello, hello, and welcome to Who Ate It First, a food history podcast with a twist. I am Kenna Rundquist. I'm Logan Rundquist. It is the holiday season. It's the holiday season. Da 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 da. Ho, ho, ho. It is Santa Claus, and I bring for you quite the tale of eggnog. I'm not going to talk like that the whole episode. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. We are talking about eggnog today. Wow. Because it's Christmas time or around Christmas time, depending on when this episode comes out. LOL. I'm excited. I don't know anything about eggnog. Yeah. Well, what's your opinion on eggnog? Do you like it? Not like it? I think it's gross. I... It's a, uh, there's a lot of opinions about eggnog, so I'm curious what yours is. It is very polarizing. I mean, I enjoy seeing it in film, and I think of Christmas Vacation when I think of ed- eggnog, where he drinks it out of the moose-shaped oh, yeah. glasses. Yeah. And that is hilarious. My mom has some, and they are amazing to drink out of. And I enjoy that. But I personally don't like to drink it. Maybe I've just had bad grocery store bought eggnog. Maybe that's my problem. I'm also lactose intolerant. So are you. True. (laughs) So I just, I can't really say on a cold day, I'm like, gee willikers, I could really use some nog. I don't say that. (laughs) That's something we'll get into, the difference between store-bought versus homemade a little bit, actually. So I'll save that for later. Have you had it just on its own, or have you had it with alcohol in it? I think it's only been on its own. <laughs> Maybe that's the problem, you know what I'm saying? I do. I actually don't know that I've had it with alcohol either. Maybe once, like a long time ago, but I don't recall exactly having it with alcohol. I think I've only had pretty much the store-bought. I know... My family made it once or attempted to make it once, but it came out like really foamy for some Ew. reason. And yeah, I didn't care for it. So we're going to try a recipe that we found later in the episode. Uh, not right now. We're going to try a, a recipe that we found um, and see if it turns out good. We'll give it a shot. Cool. So historians aren't actually sure who ate eggnog first. Who drank eggnog first? I guess I should say. <laughs> I guess, yeah, I guess it's kind of confusing. Yeah. Well, I guess you could eat it. It's a custard. So it could Kinda, be like yeah. a custard British yeah. thing. Historians aren't really sure who drank eggnog first, but they believe. Oh, consumed. There consumed. we go. Consumed. Who consumed. Yeah, there you go. Who consumed it first? New title of our podcast. I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> They're not really sure who had it first. They believe it originated in medieval England. They actually think its predecessor was a drink called posset, which just sounds so appetizing. Can you spell it for me? It's basically spelled like possum. P-O-S-S-E-T. Ew. Posset is a hot drink made of milk curdled with wine or ale and often spiced. I don't like the word curdled. Keep in mind, this was a medieval drink, so they had a little limited resources back in the day. True. On like modern day. And everybody was just constantly covered in mud. Yeah. This drink was actually typically used as a remedy for colds or the flu. Yeah. Moving forward into kind of the 13th century, monks began drinking posset with eggs and figs in it. Mm. Um, And then. Can you say monks again? Monks? (laughs) Monks? You and your pronunciation of things always make me giggle. This was also typically, since it's like a a warm drink, that's one thing that's kind of unusual too, is modern day eggnogs typically served cold. Mm -hmm. Posset was a a hot drink. So it was usually served, you know, around wintertime because of that. Anyone wants some hot milk? Sounds so good. Mm -hmm. That's what I love every day. Drinking me some hot scalding milk. They started adding sherry to the drink uh, around the 17th century. So it was now the drink posset with sherry and then sometimes adding eggs and figs. It was for a while only popular with the the rich, the aristocrats of England because eggs, milk, and sherry were actually pretty scarce back then. Mm -hmm. Those were considered commodities that only the rich could afford. Mm -hmm. So the aristocracy were really the only ones that actually would have that drink. At that point, it was used a lot to kind of give toasts. Oh, like instead of like a champagne toast. Yeah. They do a posset toast. Yeah, exactly. That's gross. (laughs) 
I found a description of a 17th century recipe for my Lord of Carlisle's sack posset. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> it uses a heated mixture of cream, whole cinnamon, uh, mace, nutmeg, eggs, sugar, amber grease, which oh. is, uh, if you're not familiar, which I wasn't, no. <laughs> is a substance from a sperm whale's digestive system. That is so specific. Why? <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's weird. It's something that I guess it gets excreted out of sperm whales. Oh, no. And they would collect it. I think when it's fresh, it smells like awful. But apparently it dries and changes flavor. And they actually use it a lot in um, food. That's fascinating. Or drinks or things like that. It also has animal musk. Mm. And sack wine, mm. which is a fortified wine similar to sherry. Oh, okay. But I that's was... why it's called sack posset. Got it. Spelled S A C K. C-K. Yeah. Got it. So as I mentioned, and in that recipe, eggnog was usually actually served hot as a wintertime drink and not cold. Mm-hmm. Eventually, the USA got colonized by the British, and posset came over to the United States because a lot of the colonists were British. It started to become actually very popular in the U.S. because unlike Britain, there was plenty of eggs and milk and other products and things like that were in abundance over here because it was primarily farmland for a long time with the colonists. So there was all kinds of eggs and milk. So it wasn't something that just the aristocracy could afford. It was something everybody could afford because it was cheap. One thing, though, that was expensive was the sherry because that was heavily taxed because it was coming from Britain. Mm -hmm. So instead, they switched to using rum coming from the Caribbeans Mm -hmm. uh, because that was much, much cheaper. Why is the rum always gone? (laughs) That was much cheaper than the sherry that they were trying to bring in from Britain. Eventually, during the Revolutionary War, though, the prices of rum started to skyrocket. So they uh, switched to using domestic whiskey instead, whiskey and bourbon. Yes, because I definitely know the difference between the two. You've had rum and whiskey before. You said whiskey and bourbon. Oh, yeah. Well, bourbon is a kind of whiskey. But not all whiskeys are bourbons. Yeah. All squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles exactly. are square. I hate those math <laughs> riddles. It is believed sometime around the 1800s that eggnog was started to be enjoyed cold as well. And I think it's around that time, too, that it was always kind of served as a wintertime drink. But I, th- I believe it was around that time as well that they started to incorporate it with Christmas time, too. I couldn't find a specific reference exactly to like when they made it officially, you know, I don't think there's like an official, it became a Christmas time drink. Got I think it. it was just always served around wintertime and just throughout history, it kind of transitioned itself into being a Christmas time drink because of the time. Gotcha. But going back to saying it started to get enjoyed cold, the, the first bartender's guide by Professor Jerry Thomas <laughs> lists eggnog as being enjoyed as both hot and cold. Professor Jerry? He wasn't an actually... A professor, he was considered the father of American mixology. Okay, I feel like he's lying a little bit with his title (laughs) here. (laughs) So he got nicknamed Professor because of his showmanship and creativity when mixing drinks. So (laughs) all of his patrons would call him Professor. Professor? Yeah. Well, I want to be Dr. Logan, the doctor of podcasting. If we're just making up titles here. (laughs) I am going to call you that from now on then. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. So over the years and into today, it has been a very popular drink and has kind of spread globally. Everyone kind of has their own take on eggnog. The Jewish community in Poland drink something called, I'm going to butcher this so bad. Do it. It's either Kogelmogel or Kogelmogel. I don't know. <laughs> And I'm so of sorry. Of course it is. To that community. I don't know how to pronounce that. Write in and tell us with the phonetic spelling how <laughs> you do this. <laughs> in Germany, they have a drink called Erlikor. Oh. Puerto Rico, they actually 
add coconut juice or coconut milk, and they've taken out the eggs to make a drink called the coquito. Oh, that sounds tasty. Yeah. It's got the juice. It's got the juice. That's obviously a reference that'll stand the test of time. Yeah, we'll see. Any TikTokers out there? (laughs) In Peru, they drank eggnog with the Peruvian brandy called pisco. Oh, pisco. Yeah. And there's many others, but I'll stop there. So the history was a little light on eggnog from what I could find. So I actually wanted to talk a little bit about the etymology of the word eggnog. I love a good etymology segment. So I thought I'd get into that a little bit because there's some debate also around the etymology of the word eggnog. <laughs> there's, they're not Also, like the origins are not 100% sure where the word came from. One person, a professor at Babson College. Are we sure this is a real one? Because we already have a fake one. <laughs> this is a this is a real professor. He it was at a college. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if he still works there, but at the time of when this article was talking about it, a professor called Frederick Douglas Opie believes it came from a combination of two colonial slang words. Rum was called grog, and bartenders served it in wooden mugs called noggins. You're so, such a grog noggin. <laughs> I'm gonna call you that now. So he believed that the drink was first known as egg and grog, oh. which I kind of want to call it from now on. Egg and, and grog. Yeah, that just sounds way more fun. Sounds very German. And then later over time morphed into eggnog. Another person, Ben Zimmer, who was at the time of this article, the executive editor of vocabulary.com, disputes the professor's claim saying that there's not enough proof to Whoa. this. Whoa. He, Shots fired. Yeah. I don't know how much debate goes on in the etymology world. but It's probably very heated and very stimulating. Probably a lot of papers written back and forth Just to each other. so many emails. <laughs> Another area that they think the term was first introduced was actually in 1775 when the Maryland clergyman and philologist, philologist, that's a I, hard word. What is what does that mean? Philologist? Oh, well, obviously it means... Pause while he not Googles mean. it. Philologist, a person who engages in philology, historical linguistics. Oh, okay. Oh. A collector of words and their etymology. That's actually kind of fun. A collector of words? Oh my gosh, somebody put that on their Tinder bio. <laughs> collector of words. Yeah, uh, that's fun. Do it up. This person, Jonathan Boucher... I'm probably butchering that also, wrote a poem about the drink, which actually wasn't published until 30 years after his death. Oh. I think that's where some of the debate is like, well, is this really like the origin of the word? Because it didn't actually come out until 30 years after he died. I'm going to try to read this. It's a little challenging. Oh. Fog drums at the morn, or better still, eggnog. At night, hot suppings. At midday, grog. My palate can regale. Wow. That was, the first part's very challenging. And lastly, there is also a 1788 article from the New Jersey Journal that referred to a young man drinking a glass of eggnog. Oh. So there's, there's a lot of different places that people think were the first use of the word or the first origin of the word, and they're not quite sure. That is nifty. So, yeah, that's a bit about both the history and the etymology of eggnog. Now, why don't we jump into the kitchen and try to make some? Let's do it. Okay, let's go. So, we are in the kitchen. We are in the kitchen. And we are ready to cook up some eggnog. Normally, you make eggnog in big batches for parties, right? It's a Christmas time drink. You do it to celebrate with family. Yeah. But we are not going to do that right now because it's just you and me. So I kind of did some research to see if anybody's made a a small batch version of eggnog. And I came across this blog called Dessert for Two by Christina Lane. And she has a two serving eggnog. So a cup for you, cup for me. Yay. Thank you, Christine. We are going to make that. Instead, because I don't want to be left with a gallon of eggnog after this episode. (laughs) Oh my gosh, no. (laughs) So we've got all our ingredients here. We have two egg yolks, 
three tablespoons of sugar, a cup of milk, half a cup of heavy cream, pumpkin pie spice, and good old bourbon. Bourbon. Her recipe actually uses freshly grated nutmeg, but I am using pumpkin pie spice because I don't currently have nutmeg, and I thought this would be a good alternative because it has nutmeg in it as well as cinnamon and a couple other spices. So the first thing we need to do is combine the egg yolks and sugar, and then I'm going to mix this up until it is a pale yellow and tripled in size. Woo! Here we go. All right, so that is nice pale yellow color, and the sugar is incorporated. <laughs> is nice. Is nice. Uh, next up, we are going to heat the milk, cream, and pumpkin pie spice to boiling. So we are just going to be pouring the milk in here. I'll be mixing this around a little bit. All right, we have our hot milk and eggs here. We're going to very slowly pour the milk into the eggs while stirring constantly. If we don't pour too quickly or don't stir, then we'll cook the eggs and no one wants scrambled eggs in their eggnog. Or maybe I do. You don't know. You don't know what I like. Christina's recipe has an optional step to use the egg whites as well. We would whip them up and then fold them into this mixture to incorporate them into the eggnog. I feel like this would actually make it pretty foamy though, and I'm not really a big fan of that. I've had eggnog that's like that before. This is an optional step, we're gonna actually not follow it. All right, there we go. Wow. All, all that is left is to chill this mixture until it's cold. And then once it is chilled, we can add the bourbon and try it out. We add the fun juice. We add the fun juice. <laughs> We'll be back to review this eggnog up next. We are back to Raver Roast the eggnog. And we actually haven't sipped it yet. So Woo. are you ready to take a sip? I'm ready. All right. I have added bourbon into this. So it is the mixture that we made just earlier and with a little bit of bourbon in there too. In our festive Christmas mugs. Yep. In our little Santa mugs that my mom got me a uh, few years ago, I think. All right. Here we go. Cheers. Cheers. It's boozy. Yeah, it is boozy. It's boozy. <laughs> I know you're not normally a big fan of bourbon. Was that too boozy? No, actually, I like it. Like, I kind of want to take it outside and turn on the fire pit and drink it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a great idea. We're going to be doing that right after this. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> All right. So time to rate it. I think I'm going to give it a, I'll say a 7 out of 10. It's good. It's, I like the, actually the pumpkin pie spice in there. I think it's nice and uh, cinnamony and nutmeggy and. It's a word. <laughs> <laughs> it is now. Yeah, it's good. I, I don't really have any complaints. I just don't think it's like a 10 out of 10. I may, I'd maybe turn tune down the booze a little bit. I might have made a little too much booze in there. <laughs> what would you say? I think I'm going to do the same. I think seven chef's kisses out of ten. It's real. I think this is probably the best eggnog I've had. So you can take you can take that. Take that credit. Okay. Best one I've had because I've had some bad ones. Better than store-bought. Definitely better than store-bought. Also, it's I think you can find lactose-free eggnog these days. But I can't imagine it's any iota of good because we are still, we as lactose free people are trying to still break into certain markets. Like I think we've got certain areas locked down, but I don't think <laughs> eggnog is where we're really excelling. I say we as, I've, as if I'm participating in any of the creation. I'm not. I'm just a consumer. I like this. And you use dairy free whipping cream. So I love that. Thank you. I did. Yeah. I forgot to mention that actually in the um, in the cooking portion, but yeah, we made this lactose free, so we used lactose free milk and a alternative heavy whipping cream. Sorry, did I say dairy free? I meant lactose free. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's not dairy free, but it is lactose free. It's good. I like I like the booze. Yeah, it yeah, might be a little 
little too boozy just for me personally because I'm not a huge whiskey bourbon person. But I'm about to put on my jacket and we're going to go out the night. <laughs> All right. Well, we better wrap this up then. So thanks again, everyone, for tuning in. This has been Who Ate It First? A food history podcast by Kendall and Logan Rehnquist. It has been a delicious time. A delicious and festive Christmassy time. Yeah. So definitely, if you liked our podcast, please subscribe to it. Tell your friends and family. And we will catch you all on the next episode. Hope everyone has a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. Happy holiday season, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye.